Hello, everyone. This is me again, Dr. Ghada Zain Abidin. Thanks for joining the class on this beautiful early morning. Actually, right now, I was writing your names uh, as you are pronouncing them. So writing is an important tool to help memorize names or anything, and also listening to your names. And if you noticed that uh, after you said your name, I tried to say it like you. This is how we study, actually. So you have to use writing and speaking aloud, okay, and listening. And above all, practicing. All right. And uh, by the way, this kind of activity, like this initial activity, this is like a hint about what we are going to do in this class, because this class is a little bit different from the previous classes. Uh, as you know, this is uh, an interactive class. It will be like the most interactive class, I hope so. And as you know, we uh, finished like five classes so far. The first one, like an overview, some tips and, and tricks, and uh, we covered the orbit evaluation or proptosis and dystopia in four classes. And today's class is the beginning of another topic, which is ptosis. Okay. If you remember this slide from the first class, we are following the same format for the final FRCS exam. We have four stations. And uh, since, uh, according to your voting, uh, one day I posted this poll, uh, which is the easiest clinical station, and nobody said or nobody voted for the oculoplastic station, so I decided to start the course by the oculoplastic. The last slide in the previous class, I advised you or I asked you to revise the chapter of eyelid, including the trauma of the eyelid, and also to go through the points to be checked whenever you have a case of ptosis, and I hope you did this uh, assignment on your own. Just a reminder that uh, I have created a playlist for the mock clinical practice. So again, since this is the first class regarding ptosis evaluation, I have like only 60 slides and uh, it's going to be, yeah, hopefully short. It's like a starter at the beginning of the big topic, which is ptosis. So again, during editing my previous classes, who is the person that speaks uh, a lot? Uh, every time it's me. But this is actually not the goal of this course. Uh, the goal of this course is to allow you to participate. So participate more and more to get confidence to speak aloud because in the final FRCS exam, the format is like oral, nothing written at all. Even in the clinical station, you are going to talk with the examiner. Okay. So uh, instead of being the most person who participate, uh, I want to turn the way around and um, you are all should participate more and speak most of the time. All right. And that's why your mics uh, will be turned on most of the time. Okay. This is a kind of deal uh, for today's class. Previously, we use the chat a lot uh, because it saves time and also you, everyone can participate at the same time, but it is not the ideal method for practice right now. So uh, you have two options. Uh, whenever I ask a question, either you raise your hand, so you are volunteer, or um, if nobody raises their hands, I'm going to choose one. So we have uh, two options, either to be a volunteer or to a victim, in order to achieve the goal of this course, to ensure victory. So I try to use three words, all start by, you know, uh, by the V. Uh, so volunteer or victim uh, to ensure victory, okay? What is the key for memorizing everything to get the best of anything is repetition. From my side, I may repeat some information because some points are relevant in every topic. So we covered proptosis. I said many things. I may repeat the same points uh, again in ptosis. And you have to do the same during your study, during your learning. Whenever you study something new, you have to repeat it until it it become like uh, established in, in your mind, right? Because the odds of remembering anything, uh, the odds of remembering or the probability of remembering anything are very slim after one exposure, okay? So you need to repeat information. And it doesn't mean uh, that you have to read again from the same source. Maybe uh, you learn something from a book, try to you know, uh, repeat this kind of information in the form of photos or videos or try to apply this on your patients. So this is an important key in the learning process is repetition. And to have to be focused. Uh, so it's not about how many hours you study at, in a day, but it's about how you are focused during the studying process. So right now, maybe you have like right now 
a number of participants, but some of our are focused, others maybe not focused. Uh, so the more you focus during uh, watching anything or listening to anything, or even uh, when you are evaluating a case, again, it's not about uh, how many patients you see every day, it's how you examine meticulously every single patient. Okay, sometimes uh, some are working in a small hospital and they see like small number of cases, but they are meticulously uh, examine every case thoroughly. They will benefit more, okay, than others who like see a lot of cases, but they are like doing cursory examination in hurry, okay? So repetition and to be focused and try to establish something called deep learning. Once you know something, try to uh, ask yourself why, uh, um, uh, are there any exceptions for any uh, guidelines or any rule, for example? So try to add on information over time. In order to achieve success. So please view the class as uh, this is a time for study. So this is like a study time. And again, it's practice time. And uh, actually, um, sometimes time is against you. Uh, some of you, their exam like is coming soon. So sometimes we are working again as a clock and we have to spend our time smartly and wisely. Okay. And uh, as you know, I, I'm trying to make uh, my presentation more interactive and more uh, like interesting and incorporate some fun and photos and videos uh, because I want also to enjoy it during the learning process. Okay. So sometimes they say, learning with pleasure, you never forget. A certain level, uh, sometimes it's enough is enough. So sometimes already you have, have the knowledge, but it's time now to practice, okay? Some candidates are like superb, but they are not practiced just before the exam. Uh, I mean here by practice, uh, the other meaning for practice, not practice on patient, but practice to be judged by someone else. Okay, some uh, candidates are actually seniors. They are like um, uh, the boss of a certain institution, but they get used of seeing patient and commenting on other junior doctors. But during the exam, uh, they lack confidence and they might be more stressed because they not get used of being judged by someone else. Okay, and they are not used to work in a limited time. So sometimes practice should be time bound because the exam, you have a limited amount of time to elicit the science and to answer the follow up questions. So practice is essential and that's why you need your colleagues. You need uh, the judgment from your colleagues just before the exam. And as you know, uh, sometimes the examiner is younger than the candidate and they have like shorter period of experience in ophthalmology than the candidates. Okay, some candidates are like 40 plus. I'm talking from my experience. So some candidates are like very excellent uh, regarding the knowledge. They have like a, a huge amount of information, uh, theoretical and practical. So they have like this minister, but when during the exam time, because of the stress and the lack of uh, concentration from fatigue, lack of sleep, perhaps, and the limited time, uh, their performance during exam uh, will be like this uh, vague creature, okay? Okay, uh, as you know, um, I'm trying to incorporate more photos and videos. Apparently, it seems like I'm a lazy person. I don't like to write a lot of information on the slides because not this is not my goal, to write uh, more information. I want you to practice on your own and to see something different, okay? And today's class, uh, you will see some slides are actually blank. I just wrote the title because uh, you are going to fill the slide together, uh, fill the information together on the slide. Uh, again, uh, you will see in the future, uh, a lot of quizzes, puzzles, games, and teasers, okay? Assignments as usual. Uh, I used to give assignments um, intensively uh, in the last year, but uh, right now I'm trying to incorporate the activities during the class itself. Okay, whenever we have a lengthy class, uh, we will have breaks, okay? Okay, this is the first activity uh, in today's class. Yeah, so uh, I always encourage you to take notes and um, whenever you hear something like very new to you or something interesting, please write it down on your notebook, okay? Or you may need to write something like... Um, like I need to revise Horner syndrome. So sometimes I, 
I shed a light on some abnormality or some disease. Uh, and you feel that you are not uh, fully knowledgeable about this disorder. So you can write in study note, uh, I have to uh, revise Horner syndrome or let's say, uh, this uh, pharmacological testing for Horner syndrome, okay? So please, throughout this class, try to take notes because the first activity that I am going to ask you to screenshot uh, these notes at the end of the class and to send it here on the Zoom, okay? I hope you can follow this advice. Another thing before we start the class, uh, I have a dedication to my thesis classes. Uh, to my uh, late professor, Hassan Farhat. I have known him uh, since I was a medical student, one of the professors who taught me uh, ophthalmology. And when I joined the ophthalmology department, he was my mentor, like my principal mentor and my principal professor. He taught me a lot, like uncountable, invaluable things. He had an important impact uh, on me professionally and uh, personally. I'm using some of his photos in Tosis classes. And actually, he was one of my supervisors in my doctorate thesis, which was about Tosis, uh, particularly Marcus Gunn. Uh, may Allah bless his soul in heavens. Here are some of the references, like books. And I incorporated this slide because at your level, you need to check books or like sources with more photos. And as you can see, the, one of the common theme in all these books is Atlas. So they are all Atlas. So we ha they have a lot of photos with few texts. Okay, because you already have the knowledge from Kaniski, from other sources, but you need more photos. And by the way, Kaniski is a wonderful book because it has a lot of photos. Okay, so at that level, you need to check references with more photos, check videos, okay, and also books about clinical scenarios, clinical cases. And there are also uh, websites about clinical cases. All right, this is the start of our class. I have a question here on the slide. Okay. So the question uh, asks, what's the oculoplastic surgeon's favorite alphabet letter? This is the first question in this class. So what do you think is the oculoplastic surgeon's favorite letter? As you see, these are all the letters. So this yeah. is a kind of clue. So one of them is uh, oculoplastic surgeon's favorite letter. What do you think? Is it uh, S? Why? Because he is a surgeon? But still, they can uh, prescribe medication. Yeah, surgical is an important um, component in oculoplasty, but it's not the only one, okay? So again, surgeon could be a uh, strabismus is a strabismus surgeon. So uh, no, it's not S. I was trying to justify your answer. You said S, yes. but you didn't mention Y. So uh, is it as I mentioned? Yes, ma'am. Surgery, because most of the surgery so, so think of, is, is oh, surgery. Yeah. Okay, so think of another answer or maybe uh, other participants can uh, help you on the chat. So I'm not leaving you at all. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes, so uh, other candidates may help him and write the answer in the chat. In the meantime, try to think of uh, another letter. Someone uh, said C, and I guess why. C. So uh, I don't know why C. C actually is a favorite letter for every ophthalmologist because it's about vision, C, C or seeing, and we have Landold C chart, a lot of C. So C is a common uh, favorite, like the best letter for every ophthalmologist. So another answer is here in, in the third row. It's P, ma'am, P. Yeah, it's P. Why? Yeah, it's correct. But why? Yeah, yeah P, proptosis, ptosis, everything comes. Yeah, excellent. Excellent, because we have proptosis, starts by P, we have ptosis, uh, again, it's silent, but it still starts by P, and we have pseudo, ptosis, pseudo, uh, yeah, uh, so we have a lot of pseudo here in oculoplasty, and again, if you noticed, uh, it's about plastic surgery, so yes. here, we have yes. P here, okay, and if you remember, uh, when we are evaluating for proptosis, we have a lot of P's, and uh, mm. yeah, a lot of P's, we mentioned a lot of P's, and uh, yes. If you have studied also ptosis, in the ptosis checklist, we have a lot of P's, okay? To have a lot of yes. P, 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 a lot of P's to be evaluated. Uh, okay, so uh, are you ready? Okay. Yes. Okay, so here is your uh, question. Uh, form a correct, like correct, uh, complete short sentence using the above keywords. We have here keywords, here uh, a keyword, and here a keyword. Uh, I want you to create uh, or formulate a sentence 
but it should be correct. Today's topic would involve proptosis. But this is not correct. Now, we already covered proptosis in four classes. Today's topic will not cover proptosis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ptosis is hidden in the proptosis. If we will remove the pro, it will be ptosis. Okay, you are very close. So, uh, please continue. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, if we will remove the pro, it will be ptosis. I want you to use all that's written on the slide. Don't remove anything. I want to keep the all letters. Okay. So, you, you are very close, but you removed... P-R-O, so I want to keep a, a P-R-O in a sentence, okay? Okay, you said ptosis, but before ptosis, there's like P-R-O. So what's the meaning of P-R-O here? Uh, does P-R-O have any meaning like pro? Like pro. So pro actually is an abbreviated form for what? To be a pro in, in anything, like, like, like professional, okay? To become a pro. So let's say, answer now, right now. So today's topic... Or let's say today's topic objective is to be a pro in this evalu in this okay in this evaluation, okay? Okay. As, uh, I know it might seem silly, but this is a kind of warm up. Uh, try to like practice uh, something called uh, higher thinking skills, um, because sometimes you might be asked questions um, in a different way or strange question in the exam. So try to think rapidly. So it was a practice okay. for th for thinking. Can be. Can be separate prop and ptosis prop. Say it again, please. Prop, P R O P prop plus to T O S I S. So can you write it in the chat because I can't hear you uh, clearly. Okay. Yeah, write it down. So it's very interesting that you uh, find ptosis inside the word proptosis. Okay. Okay, this is the time frame. So props are used. Oh, this is a kind of information, yeah. Nice information because uh, I have a, actually a quiz regarding this sentence. All right, uh, so uh, this is the time frame. Uh, we have uh, some opening slides and then um, we'll cover in next class uh, to this checklist. Then we have cases. Uh, based on previous candidate experiences and uh, then quizzes and closing the slides and hopefully we will finish uh, all these um, points in uh, four classes okay so today's um, are just like uh, some basic information opening the slides regarding ptosis evaluation and uh, there is a common saying that basics are boring okay but they are sometimes boring if or if the whole lecture is all about basics without being connected to the clinical application but i'm trying to uh, say like limited amount of basic information and try to uh, make it linked to clinical application okay uh, because sometimes basics are essential to know so regarding basics today we will cover uh, some definitions classifications uh, of ptosis Regarding the anatomy, I uh, will uh, shed a lot on uh, retractors and protractor and their nerve supply. Regarding physiology, we have an important law uh, when it comes to sosis and also uh, pseudotosis. So my first question, uh, what is the definition of ptosis? Or before this question, is it ptosis or blepharotosis? Ptosis. Blepharotosis is correct. Um. Because this is like, you know, this is a blank slide. We are going to fill it together, okay? So we have blepharotosis. And Dr. said blepharotosis is correct. And uh, Dr. said tosis is correct. Actually, both are correct, okay? But which one is more professional or more specific? Yeah, both are correct. But which one is more specific? Blepharotosis is more specific. Yeah, blepharotosis is more specific because we have here a uh, blepharo. So blepharo means uh, we are talking about the eyelid. Okay? Eyelid. On the other hand, ptosis is not specific because we have other ptosis. So we have like uh, ptosis uh, of the upper lid. Okay, we have ptosis of the lower lid. Do you know other ptosis in ophthalmology? Yeah, we have brow ptosis, and this is, by the way, an is important sign. So we have uh, eyebrow ptosis. 
What else? Eyelash. Eyelash dust. Okay. Uh, eyelash. So eyelash or eyelashes? I think eyelashes. Okay. What what else? Soda toes. <laughs> okay. So the toes. Okay. Um. Mm -mm. Keep this not now, okay? We have another important tools here in ophthalmology. Inverse toes, no? Yeah. What's the meaning of inverse toes, by the way? The lower lid goes Okay. Up. So here uh, in the lower lid, this is called inverse toes. Okay. Inverse toes. Uh, I, I will answer it. Nobody answer it. So I lacrimal gland. So they say mean lacrimal gland. There might be others, but this is uh, what I remember right now. So ptosis is actually not a specific, but for short and for saving time, we usually, whenever we say ptosis, we mean we mean this one. We mean ptosis of the upper eyelid. So whenever we say ptosis in our practice during teaching, we mean ptosis of the upper eyelid. So the next question, what is the definition of ptosis by ptosis or blepharitose? What's the definition? Drooping of upper lid. The okay, definition of ptosis, uh, drooping of the upper lid. Can you of say... The from a normal position. Of, from a normal position. Can you say the, the spelling of drooping? D-R-O-O-P-I-N. Excellent. So, so because I used to say it by one O. So it's not, not dropping, but drooping. Drooping of the uh, upper eyelid. Uh, someone said below the normal, yeah, the normal range yeah. or le normal level. I don't know, the normal level. Okay. Uh, so the next question, what is the normal level? What is the normal level? What is the normal anatomy for the upper eyelid level? Uh, so uh, to know it, what is the normal? Normally. Two millimeters below the upper limbus. Say it again. Two millimeters below the upper limbus of the cornea. Yeah, two millimeters of the upper cornea. Okay. Excellent. So uh, now I want someone to comment on the photo. I, I know this is not a viva practice, but uh, still we need to practice speaking. This is, um, may I speak? I'm yeah. Dr. Okay. So uh, this is a picture of uh, the face showing the uh, there is a drooping of uh, on examination uh, the both eyes are well aligned and Hirsch, on Hirschberg's test and the right eye there appears to be drooping with uh, left eye lid retraction but I would like to examine further to confirm my findings okay great excellent you said right now drooping of the upper eyelid Okay, but by the way, drooping Thank is you. like a layperson language, like a non-medical language. So in the exam, you can say ptosis, okay? Okay. So drooping, this is how we defined the ptosis. But here you can say there is a ptosis on the right side and that's it, okay? Yeah. Uh, and yes. if you notice the sign, the important sign, say it directly. Because you, you spend sometimes like uh, Hirschberg and yeah. But Hirschberg is important because now you are saying to the examiner, uh, there is no hypotropia, so this is not pseudotosis, right? This is what you meant, right? Yes. Okay, so excellent that you have commented on the Hirschberg is central, so there is no fear that there is uh, hypotropia. So this is actually a true ptosis, not uh, due to hypotropia. So uh, the only comment here is that you have to say ptosis and not drooping, okay? And you said uh, okay. retraction of the other side. Uh, you can add the um, contralateral um, yeah, you can say on the left side or contralateral uh, eyelid retraction. Uh, okay. Excellent. Okay. So whenever there is ptosis uh, or like, as you said, drooping, okay, we can appreciate also the tarsal show here is widened. If you remember uh, in eyelid retraction, the tarsal show, the, this part uh, in lid retraction is narrow. But in ptosis, the tarsal show is widened, okay? This is a secondary mechanical effect due to ptosis, okay? And also, the vertical palpebral fissure is narrower. So if you compare it with the other side, the vertical palpebral fissure here is uh, narrower than the other side. And this is actually exaggerated because there's also here contralateral eyelid retraction. 
why there is contralateral eye diffraction in a case of ptosis? So uh, according to Herring's law uh, of equal innovation, uh, there is uh, an attempt to increase innovation to right eye to get it to normal position. Uh, but since there is innovation to the contralateral, equal and equal amount of innovation to the contralateral side, there is retraction of the left eye. Okay. Uh, but, good, good. So you said eye, 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 but you didn't mention eyelid. Okay. And you didn't mention about the muscle. Okay. So whenever we are talking about Herring's law, Herring's law is about um, nerve stimulation to muscles. Okay. So you have to mention the muscle. Levator palpebrae superioris. Okay, so this uh, eye, so this eyelid is trying to, there is an attempt to elevate this eyelid, okay? The brain is trying to elevate this eyelid. If we imagine this is a brain here, this is a brain, okay? So there is a ptosis here. The brain is sending more stimulation, more impulses to the which muscles, as you said right now, elevator palpebrae superioris muscle, okay? to this eyelid, uh, which is the principal or the primary muscle for elevating the eyelid. And at the same time, equal uh, impulses or equal stimulation is going to the other levator, okay? But this is a normal uh, eyelid level. So as a result, because of excess innervation here, there is contralateral eyelid restriction, okay? Whenever there is a Herring's law, you have to say equal innervation and you have to state the name of the muscle, levator muscle. And uh, be careful, it's eyelid and not eye. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You would. And this photo is just this is a normal. So you have to be familiar with the normal. Uh, the upper eyelid covers, like as Dr. said, one to two millimeters of the upper cornea. This is a normal because a deviation from the normal is actually abnormal. Okay. And since the doctor uh, mentioned the um, inverse ptosis, so please uh, tell me at least three signs uh, on this photo. This is a. Limited facial photograph where I can see uh, mostly just a child with uh, mild uh, ptosis and uh, there's uh, heterochromia in this patient. The right eye, there is uh, right eye pup uh, iris, is, there is hypochromia, and I think there is uh, meiosis also in this patient. Yeah, you said first ptosis, okay? And I, I, I'm happy that you said mild, right? Yes. Yeah, you said ptosis, mild, and uh, you have to sit the side. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, okay. And in the right side, okay. Right side, yes. And you said also uh, meiosis, and you said also heterochromia. Yeah. And whenever there is heterochromia, you have to state which is uh, the darker side or the lighter side, okay? So, the right side is the lighter side, the left okay, eye is yeah. the darker okay. side. So lighter is the right, okay, excellent. And what else? Uh, you said three. And, but... the, and the lower lid is slightly up. up. Yeah. And this actually inverse uh, ptosis. By this, we mean the lower lid is elevated. Okay. The lower lid elevated on the right side. So we have ptosis, which means the drooping of the upper eyelid. And we have ptosis of the lower lid. So this uh, gives what? This gives false impression of what? Enough thermos. Yeah, so we, we call it uh, right now. Apparent in ophthalmos. Yeah, excellent. So we have to say apparent in ophthalmos. Or you can say uh, pseudo in ophthalmos. So do you think, the, uh, is it uh, a, a case for differential diagnosis or is it a case of a single diagnosis? It's a single diagnosis. So what's your diagnosis? Congenital Horner's syndrome. Yeah. On which side? You have to see right the side. Right side, right side, right side, congenital. So it's a congenital border. Okay. Do you think, doctor, there is contralateral eyelid restriction in this case? I think there is some. This clear uh, tarsal show is reduced in the yeah. left side. Yeah, if you notice, the tarsal show is, is like very narrow. Yes. Okay? Yes. So there is here, we can say that we have. Uh, contralateral eye attraction, but this is like an additional information. This is an additional information uh, in order to, to practice to be meticulous, okay? If we have a lid attraction, even if it is contralateral, uh, even if it is like compensatory, so sometimes may give a pseudo impression of what? If we have a lid attraction, might give what? 
uh, maybe pseudoproptosis. yeah maybe give a pseudoproptosis effect so pseudoproptosis because actually sometimes a uh, candidate missed the diagnosis and they, they, they think uh, or they thought this is actually a prototic eye but actually this is a pseudoproptosis because of the contrast eye detection and the abnormal side actually is the right side okay yes all right so additional question, why you said congenital? We can say only Horner. Why you said congenital? Because of the heterochromia. No? So heterochromia, uh, is it limited to uh, or restricted to congenital Horner or could be with acquired Horner? Uh, mostly congenital. No? Mostly because, congenital, uh, yeah. Yes. But it could be also with long-standing Horner as well. Okay. All right. So this is like a few points regarding what's the meaning of ptosis and uh, blepharoptosis and inverse ptosis. Yeah. So the next part is about classifications, classifications of ptosis. So tell me about the classification of ptosis. How do we classify ptosis? Different ways for classification of ptosis. Um, it can be depending upon the cause, myogenic, neurogenic, uh, mechanical, hyponeurotic. So you are talking right now about the uh, etiological classification, right? You can classify uh -huh. according yes, to the, the etiology. Okay. Positive etiology, yes, ma'am. And you said myogenic, number one. So number one, you said myogenic. And you said what? Neurogenic, right? Neurogenic, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And? The mechanical. Okay, let me forget here. But... Aponeurotic. <laughs> okay, this is aponeurotic, yeah. Yes, ma'am. So think of a levator. So levator at first, it starts as a muscle, like a belly, uh, like a fleshy muscle, and then it's uh, transformed into a pineurosis. So whenever you say myogenic, the next one should be like, yeah, it's easy okay. to remember, a pineurotic, and then yes. nerve supply, neurogenic, and we also have, what next? Mechanical. Um, yes, mechanical. Yeah, mechanical. It's like a bizarre classification, but this is most of the references write this, this way, okay? We are like imitating what is written in the references. And uh, I don't know about uh, the add traumatic here, okay? This is a kind of classification, okay. okay? So we have also another way for etiological classification, okay? This is like uh, a way for etiological classification, okay? But there is another okay. way for etiological classification, it's still about etiology. Somehow, okay? Sometimes they divide it according to, let's say here, the onset of ptosis okay. itself. So we can classify it into what? According to the acute? onset. Uh, no, not okay. acute. Okay, okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Local involving? No. So I'm congenital and acquired. Yeah, according to the onset of ptosis, okay, okay. So who said pupil involvement, by the way? Mom, myself, doctor. Okay, so usually pupil involvement or not pupil involvement usually said with certain nerve palsy, okay? So please don't confuse, okay? Okay. Uh, so yes. this is a kind of classification for certain nerve palsy. Uh, and um, acute and chronic, um, yeah, it's not. It's one of the point to be assessed in ptosis or any sign in okay. in medicine. But usually, as Dr. said, congenital or acquired. So this is another way of classification. Okay, B because there are different classification in different references, and uh, they are overlapping somehow, maybe confusing somehow. I don't know. Let's uh, ask you further questions. Suppose we are talking about now, now congenital. Ptosis, like common scenario, a child born with ptosis, okay, or uh, parents notice ptosis, drooping of one of the upper eyelids or both, I don't know, since birth or shortly after birth, okay, so we have congenital ptosis. What do you think, is it myogenic, aponeurotic, neurotic, mechanical, or traumatic? Um, aponeurotic. The levator palpable superioris aponeurosis is actually either not formed or it is non-functional. It's a good try. Uh, what's the meaning of good try? Uh, you have to try again. So good try is another way to say try again. <laughs> myogenic. Uh, myogenic, we can yeah, say. Myogenic, yeah, myogenic. If you remember one of the class of Dr. Verma, uh, in the last, the previous class, actually, he said the, the this genesis of the levator muscle. So usually uh, we say myogenic, okay? Myogenic. Um, yes, sir. So but it, in between brackets, 
is it all cases or most cases yeah most cases there can be other causes too yeah excellent so most cases most cases of congenital ptosis are myogenic but we have exception like exception sometimes the cause may be traumatic who knows okay like what yes. like traumatic uh so th just an example that sometimes we have a congenital ptosis but due to congenital horn so this yes. is like a point to be noted not all the cases of congenital ptosis are myogenic the next question is about someone said who said involutional ptosis involutional is it involutional or senile senile it should be senile yes senile it should be senile or should it be senile yes. it should or it shouldn't which is better senile uh, involutional appears better ma'am uh, there's nothing like with age people has have to get doses nothing like that so involutional uh, appears to be a better term yeah yes so in the exam uh, in front of the patient if the patient is like english speaker so you can say involutional or you can say age related but involution is yes, the best term and i think uh, most references right now um they, they write it as involutional ptosis. But the old, the other term is senile. But in medicine, we try to use uh, softer terms or euphemism, euphemistic language. Mm -hmm. And mostly, mostly, mostly the cause, which one? Myogenic, aporetic, neurogenic, mechanical, traumatic. So mostly is? Aponeurotic. Aponeurotic. All right. So this is a kind of, you know, classification here, the etiology. All right. But we have another way of classification of ptosis according to degree. Mild, moderate, and severe. So we have here uh, mild. So can you remember the numbers? Um, less than 2 millimeters is mild. Mm -hmm. Okay. And by the way, uh, what do you mean by 2 or 3 or 4? What do you mean by this? Yes, ma'am. 2 millimeters of uh, upper lid drooping yeah. more than the normal level. E and. Uh, Excellent, excellent. So uh, this is the amount of uh, drooping and not and uh, not the MRD1, okay? So MRD1 is not the amount of drooping. We will stress on this point in the next class. And this is like an important classification when it comes to decision for surgery, okay? And sometimes they uh, classify according to not uh, not people affected or not affected, like people sparing or not sparing, as someone said, but according to people uh, coverage. We can say, is it covering the pupil or not? So it's like, yes or no. Again, this is important with, for decision for surgery. And we have different classification, like is it like a stable ptosis or um, variable ptosis? And also this is an important way for classifying. We have different type of classification, okay? But is, is this enough for at the moment? Okay, next slide about the anatomy. We have something called retractors. And, and as you can see here, we have here S. So we have like plural uh, retractors, but we have protractor. And uh, it seems that we are talking right now about, about muscles, okay? And their nerve supply. So uh, let's start by retractors. So what's the meaning of retractors? What's the meaning of retractors uh, in relevance to ptosis? The set of muscles which pull back the upper eyelid. Yeah, simply uh, muscles that retract the upper eyelid, okay? Or we can say elevate the upper eyelid. Because uh, when you uh, when you were a medical student, we usually say, uh, we use this to say elevator. Elevate. Or, yeah, we, us we usually say this like elevator uh, of, the, of the upper eyelid. Because most of the time we are talking about the upper eyelid, okay? But uh, later on, uh, the... the they give it uh, retractors, like retractors. Uh, so this is actually the, the same meaning, okay? This is like the same meaning. So what are the retractors of the upper eyelid? Levator palpebrae superioris and Muller's muscle. Uh, so you can say right now uh, we have the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. And uh, in between brackets, this is like the main muscle. Okay, this is like the, the principal muscle or the most important muscle for elevating the, uh, the upper eyelid, okay? Okay. And you said uh, molar, right? Okay. Do you have other muscles? And frontalis also contributes. 
Yeah, so it's very important to remember this because it's uh, will be uh, it's gonna be relevant in our evaluation. Okay, frontalized muscle. Now coming to an important part, which is uh, the nerve supply for each. So how you have to tell me? Uh, so you have to tell me the nerve supply for every muscle. And uh, cranial nerve three, the oculomotor supplies the levator papillary superioris. Mm -hmm. So, so three, uh, the third cranial nerve. Uh, try to be more specific. Which branches? Which branch? Branch um, of thalamic. Yeah, uh, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, it's the. Um, so, uh, by the way, the oculomotor superior. Nerve, yeah, superior branch. And the third uh, nerve, superior division. yeah, superior division, we can say division, better term. Yes, superior branch. Division, okay. So as the, the oculomotor nerve enters the orbit uh, divided, okay? So uh, it immediately divides into upper uh, or like superior branch and uh, superior division and inferior division. So the superior division uh, supplies what? Supplies the levator and another muscle, which is? Superior rectus. Yeah, so, and, um, and this uh, again uh, will... Uh, is relevant to ptosis because sometimes we have like ptosis in congenital ptosis and we have weakness of the superior rectus muscle. Okay, in biologically they are closely related. So the superior yes. division of the third nerve supplies the levator and also the superior rectus. Uh, number two, the molar. What is the nerve, 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 nerve supply? It gets sympathetic innervation. Uh, okay, and frontalis. Seventh okay. nerve. Yeah. Seventh yeah. Nerve. What's the name of the seventh nerve? Facial. Facial. Facial nerve. Again, try to be specific. Which branch? We have five terminal branches. Well, temporalis. Temporal and? Temporal and zygomatic. Zygomatic. And zygomatic. And zyg yeah, zygomatic. Excellent. So this is like a hint about the basics. You may need it. You may not. I don't know. But when we are talking about the applied uh, the application on clinical, we uh, this kind of information will help in the future. Let's add some more information, like some confusing information. Okay, are you ready for some confusion? Okay, let's uh, uh, write it in something like blue. Yeah, let's try blue. So if we have a palsy, okay, of the third nerve, what do you expect in the clinical science? Doses. Yeah, ptosis, and we usually say paralytic ptosis, paralytic. Okay, and we have others, okay? Try to be hmm. simple, yeah, try to be, you have a lot of science, we will cover it in the next classes. And now, uh, if we have, again, a palsy, like Horner syndrome, okay? Uh, we have ptosis, but in between brackets, uh, as we mentioned a few minutes back, we expect in between brackets here, mild, and also there might be also inverse, okay, of the lower, uh, those of the lower lid, okay? And now, if we have palsy of the facial nerve, and I have to say lower motor neuron lesions of the facial nerve, do we get ptosis? No. No, okay, no ptosis. But, but what? Uh, the loss of forehead wrinkles. Mm. Lack of there is... Okay. Uh, okay. We will cover this in the future, but but let's uh, think for a while. The facial nerve supply also the orbicularis muscles, right? Yes, ma'am. So um, orbicularis is the opposing muscle for levator. Mm. So uh, when we have palsy of the orbicularis. Who is taking the upper hand right now? Elevator. Elevator. So we actually expect retraction. Okay? Mm -hmm. And But actually, this is in acute cases. So if you remember, if you are studying from Kaniski, and there is a, like a table uh, that I really hate, uh, which is about causes of upper eyelid retraction, you will find facial nerve palsy among the causes. Why? Because the, uh, the orbicular is now is paralyzed and we have an opposed, uh, an opposed action of the levator and levator retracts the upper eyelid. So uh, facial nerve palsy is among the causes of the retraction of upper eyelid, uh, of upper eyelid okay? And also I can add this um, 
also another point to be noticed in facial nerve palsy, lower, again, notice it's lower. Uh, Dr. Phillips said brow ptosis. And as you know, brow ptosis, as a result of gravity or like mechanical, actually this is one of the causes of pseudo -tosis. So if you remember the appearance of facial nerve palsy, there is like drooping of the whole face. So all the face is drooping. So uh, those paper, those patient has like drooping of the whole face, including the brow. It might give a pseudo to this appearance. So it's a bit complicated when it comes to the clinical picture of facial nerve, and I hope we can cover it uh, in one class, uh, in one of the neuro classes actually, or maybe cover it in toes. I don't know. But the most important uh, point to be noticed that uh, facial nerve palsy, um, yeah, facial nerve supplies the frontalis and so frontalis muscle, one of the muscles that can help in elevation of the upper eyelid, but facial nerve palsy uh, doesn't result in ptosis, okay? Got it? Uh, here in this diagram, uh, again, uh, if you noticed, this is, uh, as I said before, the levator palpebrae is uh, like fleshy here, and then becomes uh, what? A peneurosis. So sometimes we divide the, the causes into myogenic causes and aperiodic ptosis, okay? And the muscles, the undersurface of the aperiodic and it's inserted in the upper border of the tarsus, this is the molar muscle. Sometimes they call it uh, Mueller. Uh, this is like an American pronunciation. And sometimes they call it superior tarsal muscle, okay? And the smooth muscle because it's supplied by the sympathetic, okay? And this diagram uh, is not... 100% accurate, but it shows um, the here, since this is a superior orbital fissure, by the way, this is a, in the orbit. So the oculomotor nerve immediately, but this is not accurate, uh, not fully accurate, it divides into superior division and inferior division. The superior division supplies the uh, superior rectus, okay, and levator, okay, only two muscles. The inferior division supplies three muscles, inferior oblique, inferior rectus, and medial rectus, okay. Uh, the next slide is going to be more accurate. Here, as you can see, here this is the, the superior division of the oculomotor. And this one is the inferior division of the oculomotor nerve. Again, it, once the oculomotor enters the orbit, it divides immediately into superior branch and inferior branch. And as you can, if you remember, within the common tendinous ring of Zen here. So this is a superior branch, and this is the inferior branch, supplies the inferior rectus and inferior oblique and the medial rectus. And this is of optic nerve, and uh, this one is the six, uh, the abducent nerve, supply the rectus, and here is a trochlear nerve, supplies the uh, oblique muscle, superior oblique, but this is outside the tenderness ring. Some basics. So what's the meaning of protractor nerve? So retractors or elevators of the upper eyelid, we have three muscles. The, pr the most important one is levator, followed by the Mueller and, some, and also frontalis. So we have like three muscles. Sometimes they add also superior rectus. But anyhow, we have three retractors. And how about protractors? What's the meaning of protractor of the upper eyelid or the uh, protractor of the eyelids? It depresses the eyelid, no? Oh. Close. Yeah, close, yeah. So actually, protractors means um, occlusion yeah, of the fissure, of the palpebral fissure, of the palpebral fissure. Uh, in other ways, we are talking about what? Orbicular equili muscle. Okay? And uh, as we just mentioned, uh, it's supplied by the facial nerve, temporal and zygomatic. So it's like, it's like uh, maybe a new term, but protractor means, here means orbicularis. So I'm sure that you already know that uh, in order to uh, assess levator function, we need to uh, negate or uh, prevent the frontalis from elevating the upper eyelid. And in order to do this, uh, we need to um, press on the insertion of the frontalis. Uh, another way to place our thumb or our finger on the eyebrow, okay? But notice here, most of the insertion of the frontalis actually mainly in the medial two thirds of the eyebrow, okay, here. Okay, so in order to uh, negate the action of the orbic uh, of the frontalis, you have to press 
mainly on the in this area okay because some candidate previous candidate are like pressing on the lateral part so you have to press on the medial uh, two thirds of the eyebrow okay here so this is the, the, the correct way to place your thumb or your finger in order to negate the action of the uh, frontalis muscle before assessing the levator function okay because uh, in physiology or in not physiology in mechanical if you um press on the insertion of a muscle, you prevent it from its action, okay? But if you place your uh, finger here, laterally, so this is uh, inaccurate, inaccurate um, way to, to prevent the frontals from its action, clear? And here about the branches of the uh, facial nerve, two branches supply the orbicularis, the temporal branch, and the zygomatic branch. And, and I like this uh, diagram because it shows the parotid gland because it's important to remember that uh, the division takes place inside the parotid, parotid gland. So something I'm showing the, you this photo because somehow it's related to the orbicularis. Uh, you may think this child uh, has uh, toothes here. Actually, there is no toothes here. Okay, but this child is just squeezing her left eye because she has like uh, intermittent exotropia because um, some of the patients with ex intermittent exotropia, they squeeze one eye or wink one eye to avoid diplopia. So sometimes uh, some candidates um, misdiagnose the case or like um, they are maybe confused. So try to differentiate between toses, okay, and from uh, photophobia or blepharous spasm. Uh, because of overaction of the orbicularis. So if you remember, orbicularis is just closing the eyelids, okay? It's just closing the upper uh, and lower eyelids. It's like closure of the palpebral fissure. So this is actually not uh, toes of the upper lid and inverse toes of the lower lid. It's just a contraction of the orbicularis, okay? So try to, to think and uh, look carefully uh, because it might be confusing, okay? This is not toes, just photophobia. So I found it an interesting uh, case to, to share uh, because actually one of the candidates uh, missed a case because he thought she had uh, ptosis, but actually just bilifero spasm. Now we have a quiz. Okay, the quiz is about the common theme. Uh, what is the common theme in all photos? There is something common in all photos. Ptosis, ma'am? Yeah, ptosis. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Can you add additional word to ptosis before ptosis? Pseudotosis. Yeah, pseudotosis. Yeah, excellent. Pseudotosis. Um, yeah, excellent. So the first photo is pseudotosis because actually this is a case hypotropia. of... Hypotropia. Yeah, this is actually a case of hypotropia. And um, as a result of hypotropia, there is the eyelid follows the eyeball. This is like a rule, okay? So uh, whenever we have hypotropia, we might get pseudotosis. Okay, if you apply the definition of ptosis, drooping of the upper lid, yeah, it's uh, it's apl applicable here. And sometimes when I teach, uh, sometimes I add to the definition of ptosis, drooping of the upper eyelid beyond the normal level, provided the eye is uh, aligned, provided there is no hypotrop hypotropia. Anyhow, so this is, uh, that's why very important at first to comment on the Hirschberg test and to ensure that there is no hypotropia. Because uh, if we have a hypotropia and pseudotosis, there is no point for assessing ptosis. Now the case is about squint, not ptosis uh, at all. Uh, here in this photo, uh, pseudotosis because what? We have pseudotosis. As you can see, the tarsal shoe is widened here. Yeah. It's a dystopia. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry, so, hypotropia. Okay. Uh, it's like confusing. So, uh, let's see. Let's magnify. Yeah. Enophthalmus. Enophthalmus. Enophthalmus here? Okay, I will say it because it's not, it's not clear, actually. Actually, this is a case. Uh, I, I've taken this photo, by the way, from Kaliski, the ninth edition. So, uh, I thought it would be easy. But actually, this is an artificial eye. Okay, this is an artificial eye. Okay. And uh, whenever we have an artificial eye, um, nothing is perfect 100% uh, regarding the symmetry. So if you notice the upper and lower eyelid is not as the other side. So actually, uh, 
Artificial eye is one of the causes of pseudotosis because we don't have such uh, symmetry, symmetrical, uh, symmetrical fitting or perfect fit, okay? And here, uh, this is uh, pseudotosis uh, because what? Because of what? Dermatocalis. Yeah, but dermatocalis uh, is there on the right side also. But there is uh, an additional element or additional factor for... Um, Brow toes, brow toes. Yeah. Excellent. So we have brow toes. If you draw a line here, you will find the uh, the eyebrow here is lowered, or maybe the other one is higher. I don't know. But here, this is uh, according to the key answer. This is a brow toes. What do you think is the cause for this case? What do you think is the cause for this uh, brow toes? Actually, facial nerve palsy. Yeah, actually, the lower, yeah, you have to add lower facial nerve palsy, lower motor neuron, and there is no even uh, the frontalis, the, the lines, you know, it's not there, but it's there on the other side. Okay, so brow ptosis is one of the causes of pseudotosis, and here because of the contralateral proptosis and eye detraction, it gives a pseudo ptosis on the other side. And uh, actually, this is what is written in Kaniski. Uh, we have like important causes for pseudotosis which are hypotropia on the epsilateral side, artificial eye, brow tooth is usually symmetrical, uh, usually bilateral, but here it is unilateral. Or maybe because the other side, the contralateral side has proptosis or has the distraction, giving a pseudo appearance of ptosis on the other side, okay? So uh, again, uh, back to the case of hypotropia, how we can confirm how, how do we confirm that this is a case of pseudotosis on the right side by? Cover test. By elevating the upper lid. <clears throat> so, Cover test. Okay. Uh, one sec. Uh, so, uh, Dr. So elevating what? Uh, okay. I'm elevating, elevating the uh, right eye. Uh, oh, okay. You mean elevating upper the upper lid. eyelid? And, uh, yes, ma'am. To look at the corneal reflex because it is not seen right now. Yeah. Okay. So, imagine now you're elevating the upper eyelid and you found hypotropin. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this means uh, this is a pseudotosis. Okay, we have like uh, different case scenarios. Okay, I try to make it simple. So now we have hypotropia. Hypotropia. We may have a case of hypotropia and pseudotosis, or maybe we have hypotropia with true tosis. Okay, and now. Let's uh, make something else. Okay, here, uh, now, uh, as you, so you said, uh, you will elevate the upper eyelid. Okay, manually, you are manually retracting the upper eyelid, and you found here hypotropia. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But actually, it's already, it's already not noticeable that there is hypotropia even in this photo. But anyhow, you elevated the upper eyelid, and you notice hypotropia. Is it, uh, is it enough to document the presence of pseudotosis? No, no because... No, yeah, no, be, it's not enough. Because uh, actually, uh, because we have two possibilities as here, as I, as I, I wrote no. here, okay? Yeah, there is no question regarding hypotropia. Again, you elevate the upper lid, there is hypotropia, and... Um, but... Uh, we have to perform the cover yeah, test. Yeah, we, we need to do a cover test. Okay. So as you can see right now, so you have to cover the fixating eye and encourage the patient to fix on a light torch or a target or anything. And now you have, if the upper eyelid becomes normal, so this is equal, this equals pseudotosis, okay? But sometimes you cover, you have another possibility. You may cover the other eye, okay? And the eye takes fixation, but still there is some element of ptosis, okay? So it might be uh, there is a true tosis with hypotropia, okay? And uh, actually, there is another possibility that you might cover this eye, and this eye doesn't take the fixation because there is a restrictive element uh, prevent or like total palsy uh, preventing the eye from taking the fixation. But uh, we are trying to make it simple, uh, and I think if they are going to give you a case in the exam, they will give you a case like this simple case, okay? Um, you cover the fixating eye, and this eye takes the fixation and the eyelid becomes normal. So this is actually a hypotropia with pseudotosis. So very important. Uh, this is the first question to, to ask yourself. So if you remember when we were talking about proptosis, remember the first question is, is it true or pseudoproptosis? And now we are 
saying the same. Whenever we have a case of ptosis, make sure is it true or pseudo, okay? And remember, uh, we might get both. So this is another example from an old reference, and uh, we have like a severe ptosis here, uh, but actually the, the eye is hypotropic um, behind the eyelid. So the, what is the next step? To cover the fixating eye, and now the eye, uh, the eyelids becomes normal. So this is actually a case of hypotropia causing secondary ptosis. So my question for you right now, what do you think is the position of the eye behind the occluder here? I'm hypertropic. Yeah, hypertropic according to the Herring's law. So Herring's law uh, applicable on extraocular muscles and also applicable on the upper eyelid uh, regarding the levator. Okay, let's see the comment here, here on occlusion of the left eye. Uh, the right eye elevates and the left eye under the cover shows what hypertropia according to Herring's law. And since we get now uh, upper eyelid position normal, so we have pseudo ptosis. And here, this is a slide from the first class in our uh, course. Uh, this is actually a case of artificial shell. Uh, so be careful uh, and come closer to the patient uh, be, in order to notice artificial shell. Because in artificial shell, we may have like uh, pseudo, like imperfection, like. Um, the fissure may be like this uh, with pseudotosis. So the first question in tosis evaluation, is it true or not? Uh, the second question in our clinical practice actually is to decide, is it an emergency like in Cerner palsy or Horner, acquired Horner or not? So uh, uh, there are many questions to be asked whenever we have a case of tosis because tosis is not a diagnosis. It's just a clinical sign. We need to add and we add more information in order to reach a diagnosis. Again, ptosis is not a diagnosis, it's just a sign. Okay. So first you have to ask yourself, is it true or not? And then uh, and then you have to decide is it an emergency case, uh, like neuroemergency case, or we can um, take time and uh, reach a diagnosis um, yeah, reluctantly. I don't know if we can say this, but uh, very important to exclude uh, life-threatening causes like in emergency cases, okay? So the, the last point here is about the physiology. So, uh, so I already covered this. Uh, Herring's law is not only regarding the extraocular muscles, but also the eyelid muscles, uh, basically the levator. So let's read it together. So someone can read this, uh, what's written on this slide. Go ahead. Yeah. Herring's law of equal innervation. Mm -hmm. This is the law of equal innervation. It states that equal and simultaneous innervation flows to the yoke muscles for conjugate eye movement. For example, for a levo version, equal and simultaneous innervation is received by... Yeah, uh, say it. Fill in okay. the gaps. Uh, levo version. Mm. Mm, a right-sided... Medial rectus mm -hmm. and left sided lateral rectus. Yeah, excellent. But again, uh, it has a rule, and uh, we will uh, add on this. Um, we will repeat this kind of information, this piece of information in the in the following classes. So uh, it's also relevant to the upper eyelid. We discussed about this case, but let's um, add some more information about uh, this slide or this photo. I said before that once we have uh, a tosis, uh, as a, uh, a response or a compensation for this tosis, yeah, so the brain will try to elevate this uh, upper eyelid, right? And at the same time, there will be an elevation of the uh, upper eyelid, okay? So um, uh, one response is we have overaction of um, both levator palpebrae superioris muscle, okay? So what is the result of this? Um, okay. uh, on the affected side, uh, the ptosis may, be, uh, may look, uh, may look um, milder, okay? So imagine now uh, the brain is sending um, more impulses to the levator, mm -hmm. Okay, so it may under so under uh, underestimate the ptosis. Uh, in other words, appears appears milder. 
but uh, it's not on every case. Sometimes the brain send more stimulation for this levator, but this levator is not working at all, like in total palsy. So whatever the brain is sending impulses, there is no effect on this side. Okay, and uh, on the other side we have contralateral lead restriction. Yeah, Herring's law is applicable for every uh, in in tooth in general, re regardless of the diagnosis. Okay, and uh, regarding the chat message here, so Herring's law is applicable. Okay, um, but but not all cases are showing the uh, the Herring's law. Uh, we will cover this in the checklist of assessment of those because there is a point in the checklist regarding Herring's law. Okay, okay. So uh, once again, I'm going to repeat the information again. So in toses, uh, there is overaction of the both of both levator. On the affected side, it might improve the toses. On the other side, it might release. It's all about might, not all, not it should, but it might, okay? Because not, not all cases show contralateral eyelid distraction. Another uh, compensation that you may get is overaction of frontalis. Because we said before that frontalis helps uh, levator in elevating the upper eyelid. And that's why um, in some photos, uh, and actually in this photo also, in this photo here, let's try another line. You will find here the, uh, the high arched eyebrows. There is somehow overaction of the frontalis muscles, okay? So in some cases you may find uh, high arched eyebrows, um, and this means that the frontalis is overacting. Uh, sometimes you call it recruitment, recruitment of the frontalis uh, or overaction or high arched eyebrows. Again, if we have uh, overaction of the frontalis, uh, the, the uh, toses uh, will appear milder, okay? Will appear milder. So this is some of the changes in the muscles as a result of toses. Okay, so uh, we finished the class. Uh, the Next class will be about the toes checklist, okay? I have written a checklist for uh, toes, but I'm not going to show you right now. Uh, but as you can see, uh, we have many points as in as we did in uh, in proptosis evaluation. We have some specific points like a special assessment because this is a case of toes, and we have other uh, like general assessment for ocular examination and systemic examination. Here I uh, we have a vector here of the camera because whenever we have a case of uh, in our practices uh, applicable for clinical practice, we have to photograph. Whenever we have a case of oculoplasty or strabismus, we need we need to document the case by photography. Again, the best checklist is the one you do by yourself because you need to organize the points because we have many points. But again, the first point uh, should be an inspection or observation. And the second point will be about measurements, okay? The additional points, you can reorganize them or reorder them uh, as you like. Remember, it's not all about you are not acting or wasting time in evaluation. There is an aim behind every single point. Because the points is all about what? The points are need to be checked in order to reach the diagnosis, the etiological diagnosis, okay? Because ptosis per se is not a diagnosis. In order to decide the line of management, if we are going to do surgery, what kind of surgery? Because we have different uh, types of surgeries for ptosis. Uh, and what is the goal of surgery? For example, is it functional to restore vision because the eyelid is covering the pupil and there is a risk of amplopia, for example, or is it due to cosmesis, just for cosmesis? And we have to decide again about the urgency for um, establishing the diagnosis and treatment. Uh, here is, I photographed the, my checklist before shooting the, my video. Uh, you have to go through the steps and you have to be prepared by the tools, okay? Just tell me five. I wrote here 10 points, but give me just uh, five points regarding what are the tools needed for this evaluation. Pen torch. Yeah, pen torch. Ruler. Yeah. Occluder. Mm -hmm. A near target. Yeah, accommodation target. Okay. Okay, we'll cover uh, the other tools in the next class, okay? 
And as you can see here, this is the tools, a small area here. Uh, I wrote down what are the required tools uh, whenever I have a case of tosis. Okay, those who are like following me over the last two years, I used to give uh, assignments to candidates. So I usually ask them to uh, video record themselves uh, doing uh, some of the uh, clinical tests on volunteer or in a patient. Okay, uh, like on this message. So I ask them to uh, do a video regarding TOSIS evaluation, some points regarding TOSIS evaluation. And then they send uh, their video. Okay, uh, I camouflage the video because I haven't taken the consent from the candidate. And after I watch their videos, I, I give them like a personal uh, feedback, okay, about the good points and about the points to be adjusted or modified, okay. But uh, recently I turned the way around and I shoot the video, so I I'm the one who shoot are uh, shooting the video. I always try my best, but uh, during the editing I realized that I had forgotten some issues and there are some other things that could be have done better, okay. So, and that's why I asked you to watch the video. It's uh, like, it's a crude video, it's like unlabeled. You will find the like blanks area and the question marks. And uh, I asked you to uh, watch the video and try to reflect on the video and to Im imagine some, uh, what am I, am I doing, okay? What are the points that I was assessing in the video, okay? Uh, I, by the way, I would like to thank who assisted me in shooting the video and uh, without their help, I wouldn't be able to do this. So this actually one of your assignment uh, for, for the next class to watch the video and try to reflect on the video. Quickly, uh, I will show you the video. Uh, so here, for example, here, uh, you whenever you find uh, like a question mark or a blank area, yeah. And in this part, for example, I am hiding what I'm doing, actually. I'm trying to help you to like turn on your imagination and try to imagine what I'm doing, okay? But, uh, I want also to tell me in the next class about the flaws and mistakes and things that could have been done better, okay? And uh, by the way, try to apply on a patient, on a volunteer. Uh, again, it's not only enough to practice on a volunteer, you have to practice on real patient in cases with stoses, because in patients, we will find signs and you will learn how to document the findings. Uh, because uh, education without application is just entertainment. We are not here watching a movie or, or things like that. We are trying to help you to do this on your own, on your patients. Okay. Uh, this is like number one assignment. Number two assignment uh, that I asked on December last year that try to buy agenda or like 24, um, you know, uh, the new year is coming soon, 2024. You are going to buy a new calendar so you can buy a new journal and try to write down your plans, your goals for the next year. Uh, what is the benefit of this? You can Google and search for the benefits of writing down your goals and your dreams. And uh, what else? Uh, I asked you at the beginning of the class to uh, take notes. I hope you did. I will I will be very happy if you can send uh, the screenshot. I think this is the end of my presentation. And if you are not going to send the photo, at least send on the chat right now uh, one important sentence you learned from today's class. Uh, I used to say it post meeting reflection, but now I'm saying uh, intra uh, like during the meeting reflection. It's a test for your short term memory. It's not that perfect as long term memory check, but better than nothing. So try before you leave the meeting, I will keep it for a few minutes, like two minutes. Try to just uh, tell me not direct message. So everyone can can see your message. Try to send one sentence. Thank you. And yeah, it's good to see your thanks, but I want a sentence. Okay. An important sentence you learned or you found it interesting during the class. Okay.